Shalom, everybody. This is Chris with FirstCenturyChristianity.net. Thank you so much for dropping into this podcast today. Today is just a podcast, no slides. Uh, do, is available on the video places, but you're really going to want to drop by FirstCenturyChristianity.net today because on this blog post, I'm going to put another one of those special videos that's only going to be viewable on the blog. So you got to go there, check it out, sign up for the uh, uh, mail, uh, mailing newsletter while you're there. But today, we're going to talk about the cure for communism, because most people today don't even realize what that is. They don't even have a clue. And I, I'm starting to see Internet posts that are uh, showing some, some pretty dangerous, dangerous concepts floating around. And we really need to learn our history. Uh, I am not that old. I'm a Gen Xer. And in my lifetime... Uh, it was completely unthinkable for us to ever entertain adopting the lifestyle and values of the USSR, the U Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. I am old enough to have learned to duck under my desk because we thought that nuclear holocaust was coming and that uh, desks could protect us from that. It was kind of amusing. But we, we lived under mutually assured destruction, and we lived when there was a clear and present danger uh, between the, the Soviet Union and the West, the West being the free, free nations, uh, the free developed nations versus the communist nations. And uh, the famous quote comes from Sir Winston Churchill, says, those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And, and you know what, brothers and sisters, history has not been taught in our classrooms for a long time. What has been taught is debauchery. And, and I want to think that maybe my generation was the last one to get the dose of, of reality uh, in, in the classroom, because it seems that people today don't understand the difference between our way of life and uh, totalitarian dictatorships. And please stick around. I know this is a religious channel, firstcenturychristianity.net, and God has a humongous part in today's message, but it starts with understanding history. So in the, in the Bible, we have this, this phrase, the imaginations of men, where men worship the created and they, and they worship their own imaginations. That is, we have that in, in immense quantities in Western society today, uh, where people, you know, spend their entire lives, you know, worshiping movie series like Star Wars or Marvel and things like that. They don't have gods. They don't have a god in their life. And so they, they consume media. The media becomes God, and we end up worshiping the imaginations of our of men. Now, the imaginations of men used to produce quality art. It used to produce beautiful paintings, uh, beautiful literature, and and fictional stories that reflected the cultural norms of a society. And today, our movie plots don't even make sense. People who get killed in one movie to show up 20 years later with no explanation, and we have been conditioned to just accept whatever we see, how we see it, how we feel about it. The most successful movies today are almost always just vehicles for social propaganda, where the definition of heroes is, is now shifting to where even the most vile creature can ultimately become a hero. And it is very, very strange. And, and did you ever stop and wonder how in, in, uh, in, since the 90s, right, the mid 90s to today, how did we get to this place where every manner of sexual debauchery isn't just tolerated, it's celebrated. It's mandated at this point. It, it started out, I mean, the slippery slope argument is a logical fallacy until it isn't a logical fallacy. But it started out as, you know, whatever two adults do in their bedroom is their own business. Now today, if you're not willing to sit at the gay pride parade, you're a bigot. You have to accept something that is contrary to the Bible or you are demonized. How, how did we get here? Well, the, the loss of critical thinking training and the logical fallacies 
just abound. If you believe A, then you must not believe B. That's called a false dichotomy. We've lost the nuance. We've lost any time to investigate anything. Quite a few people have been convicted in the public opinion, the court of public opinion, meaning, meaning that uh, somebody has been convicted of a crime through popular media before there was even a trial. And the people who are who were convicted in the public opinion were done through nefarious depictions of the events to make you hate the person because the person stood for something that maybe the media didn't care for. And now today you either have to believe something completely the moment you hear it or reject it completely. And there's never any discussion. The positions are hammered into the ground, even completely irrational concepts that have been concretely untrue for thousands of years are now ju not just mainstream, but they're unchallengeable in, in just the span of a couple of decades. So how did this happen? And I, this is not a conspiracy. I, I know I'm going to start to sound like I'm doing conspiracy stuff. It's not a conspiracy because it's completely provable and it was done to us on purpose. And, and would you believe that these concepts were introduced into our society on purpose and for a specific reason? Well, this is why you got to go to firstcenturychristianity.net and look at this video because there's going to be firsthand testimony of a Soviet defector, a Soviet KGB agent defector in the 1980s. He defected to the West. He gave an interview, and it's it should be required viewing for all teenagers and, and those in college to, to show you that the Soviet Union did this to us. They did it, and, and they don't even exist anymore, but they started something that cannot be stopped. What's happening to us today, this godlessness and this confusion was done on purpose. And the purpose of it is to make a mess, a literal mess of a country where society and its institutions of government and religion fail, but also a psychological mess where people have no idea what to believe. We have had years of full-blown riots in the streets of the United States and other Western nations with nobody being brought to justice. It's happening right now in Atlanta. Our justice system handles cases based upon a political affiliation not on the merits of a case well that is torah it's torah that justice has to be blind the torah specifically says you shall not favor a rich man or a poor man in the matters of law it's in different places but it's there trust me or go study it right so this is terrible justice is supposed to be blind but instead justice says which box do you check and if you check the right boxes, you can get away with anything in the country today. So people are pitted against each other on issues where both folks are partially right and partially wrong at the same time. Now, when I came of age, we could sit in a room and discuss the most sensitive topics of the day and, and walk out of the room real having respect for the other person's point of view even if you didn't share it. Today, it's constant, complete friction. And if, you, if, and, and if your guy does something wrong, well, that's fine. That's because the other guy did it wrong. No, we have to come to a point where wrong is wrong, regardless of who does it. And then grace needs to come in to where we can get back to normal and say, okay, from here on, Everybody's going to be held accountable for everything. But instead of justice now, we're out for vengeance. And that's a bad place to be. Uh, these things were done to us on purpose. Confusion is a blazing fire. Who's the author of confusion, by the way? It is Satan. This tactic of overthrowing a, co a, a country from within is patterned after Satan's overthrow of Yahweh's sovereignty in the Garden of Eden. So the point is to generate a sense of outrage and hopelessness that conditions society to desperately seek a solution, even if it's an irrational solution. So you, you push people and you push them and you push them into a corner and they want out of that corner so bad that they'll do anything to get out of the corner. What does that sound like? Deal with the devil. That's what that sounds like. 
So the point of this is to bring society to a point where it makes an irrational decision that it would never normally make. Uh, the first instance of this that I want to talk about today is the Bolshevik Revolution, which was the turning point in Russia around the turn of the 20th century, 1900s, for those who are in Rio Linda, so to speak. Um, uh, the, the, this was the turning point where the Russian people enacted Soviet enacted communism and became the USSR. And communism is a system of government that is coined as giving power to the working class by the elimination of private property and the redistribution of wealth, which is completely against the Torah, by the way. But in reality, it creates a dictatorship that is so deep that you are not even free to think what you want, let alone worship how you want to worship. The government becomes God. The government replaces God, the giver of life and the taker of life, and becomes the highest authority in the land. The Russians got to this point because of deep economic problems that well-spoken people were able to blame on the aristocracy, which I'm sure the aristocracy had something to do with it, and then foment this revolution where we're going to get them. We're going to get them. We're always going to get them. It's always them. It's always this, this, this kind of blurry, over-the-horizon them that we're going to get. And, we're, and, and it fomented a... A, a rage, like a riot, like the same kind of riot where Yeshua was killed, murdered, right? And where people make a decision to redistribute, redistribute the wealth without asking questions like, where's the, re the next wealth going to come from? How is this sustained? And they turn around and make themselves oppressed by elevating people to be dictators and it turned into 80 years of complete despotism and oppression where hundreds of millions of people were killed. And they couldn't even talk about it until the Berlin Wall came down. The same thing happened with the birth of Nazi Germany. While people like to say the Nazis were far right and the Soviets were far left, both regimes were far left totalitarian dictatorships founded on socialism slash communism and the rejection of God. And, and I'm pointedly telling you the truth, even though this is getting into the you know left and right type thing, but we have to understand history before we can make educated decisions about the future of our lives. Both the USSR and Nazi Germany were leftist dictatorships, and that's just the way it is. And... Um, their tipping point was a famous night of broken glass. Now, the Nazis fomented hatred against the Jews because Adolf Hitler didn't like Jewish people. And they started blaming everything on Jews. Does this sound familiar? Because this is happening again today, where people are saying that these, these again, over-the-horizon Jewish people are controlling your lives and they're evil and this and that and the other. And it's, it's just not the reality of the situation. But even if it was, what could you do about it anyway? Uh, if, if some supremely wealthy people were controlling the entire world, right? But when I see society getting conditioned to overthrow the super wealthy and redistribute their wealth, I start thinking of the beginning of Nazi Germany and the beginning of the USSR, Brothers and sisters, history is repeating itself, and theft is theft. Justice is different than theft. Justice is if you find somebody with ill-gotten gains, and they get punished by the law, stripped of their wealth, and the wealth gets restored to the people that it was, it was stolen from. That is completely Torah. That's completely the way we're supposed to live. But the famous night of broken glass, Kristallnacht, in Germany was the tipping point where Jews had been besmirched for years as being evil, were discriminated against until this night, where, where Jewish homes and businesses were ransacked by Germans and Austrians. 267 synagogues destroyed, while authorities looked on and did nothing. If this sounds familiar, it really should. Because our own society had riots all over the place a couple years ago, where the police were forbidden from protecting the peace. And it's happening again right now in some of our cities. What is going on? Either violence is wrong or violence is 
not wrong. And if we get to the point where violence is not wrong, then it turns into chaos and vigilante justice. And nobody wants that. Nobody wants that. If you think that that's a good alternative, then you need to stop and go read your Bibles because you do not want to live in the Wild West in, in 2023. So how was the U.S. combating this because these these nations were overthrown because nefarious people introduced false ideas repeated them so much got people destabilized and they made the irrational decision to become willfully become servants and, dic and under a dictator well in 1957 the united states added the phrase in god we trust to our currency this was one small part in the fight against communism and socialism. It was put there to remind us that our nation only exists by the grace of God, that this nation is not godless, and that our leaders are accountable to him. It was a direct response to the godlessness, godless regime of the USSR that was undermining our way of life in the 1950s. They, they wanted to, de, to norm, normalize debauchery. The Soviet Union, on purpose infiltrated our country and wanted to discredit God, introduce debauchery, and watch our nation fall apart. Then, once that happens, they come in in the aftermath and they either destroy us or take us over. And again, I'm going to embed a video of a guy who confesses to being part of, of this plan. Okay? And the godless always want to spread their godlessness and then replace themselves as God. So you understand when the people tell you that there is no God, what they're really saying is they want to be that God. They want to get rid of that, that concept you have of an absolute authority with absolute morality, and then they want to replace it with something of their own. So Sir Winston Churchill was the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom of Great Britain, during World War II, and for a long, a long time. He was before and after. So when Hitler started taking over countries, Churchill spoke out and wanted to intervene early. And he was dismissed in favor of dis diplomacy and negotiations. And once it became the reality that Adolf Hitler was not interested in diplomacy or negotiations, that he was just using those things to help stall any type of resistance so that he could continue gobbling everything up because Adolf Hitler wanted to own all of Europe. And he almost got there. He got to the point where he was uh, bombarding Britain. Britain was only protected by the English Channel uh, because it was a land. It wasn't part of the land of Europe, or not all of it was, is. And, and he was just bombarding the place with the Blitz, the Blitzkrieg, where they were just bombing every single night. And Churchill would go on the radio and reassure people, and they said they resolve, they're gonna, they're gonna stay. They're either gonna die or they're gonna win. They're gonna push it back. And so they suffered the blitz until we joined the war and helped our British family and European friends to liberate Europe. It was in a, a very, very bloody mess. And so the, this is the man. It, Winston Churchill, who said those who fail to know history are doomed to repeat it, and we have forgotten his history. I mean, brothers and sisters, this is this is a reality, is that the guys who went over and fought World War II did awful things to defeat the Nazis and to defeat Tojo's Japan, liberate the world. When it came time to come home and rebuild the country, they didn't want to talk about it. They didn't want to they didn't want to talk about it and they decided that it put their lives into perspective and it would put everybody's life into perspective when you when you have to go and and, and watch all of your friends die in war you, you don't really want to relive those memories so we have to know it and we have to know why did all those men go over there to die and liberate and, and liberate Europe and free us all so that we could continue our way of life which while flawed is much better than the than the alternative. So the USSR, which is stands for the U Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, aka the Soviet Union, started a program of destabilization in the United States in the 1950s. You see, World War II happened, and we were allies with the Russians, with the USSR, 
And when it stopped, we divided Europe with them. And it, that to the point of where Berlin, the capital of Germany, was divided in two, East Berlin and West Berlin. You had a communist side, you had a free side. And in 1991, which is the year I graduated from high school, the Berlin Wall came down and, this, and the Russians and, the, and communism was officially defeated. And the way they took, but the way they took over countries until that point was to introduce this program of destabilization, to create havoc, get people to not know which, to just disbelieve everything, to get people to the point where they don't even believe that the sun rises in the east. And then the poor people invite them in as the solution. They say, oh, we can come in and solve all of your problems, comrade. We can give you order. We can give you peace. And so the people invite them in, and then it's too late. The tanks come in, they surround the place, they lock it off, and your freedom is gone, and you are now a ward of the state. So I really want you to watch the video at the bottom of this and understand this firsthand testimony of a KGB agent who was educated and designed to infiltrate and do this stuff to us. And if you search on the internet for the, the points of the Communist Party entered into the U.S. House of Representatives in the 1960s, I believe the Communist Party put out exactly what they wanted to do to bring about the destruction of our way of life. So the West defeated the Soviet Union and communism in 1991 when the Berlin Wall fell. Our way of life defeated the Soviet socialist dictatorships because our way of life is superior because we fear God. Unfortunately, nobody could stop what they had started with destabilizing our society. It has continued to run on autopilot ever since. And that's why we're falling apart. Because it's still running. When you defeat an invisible enemy, nobody can tell the invisible enemy to stop. They had succeeded to a point in infiltrating our media and our schools. And this is one very large reason why people question even the most concrete of facts, like the shape of the earth and that there are only two genders, right? We don't see absolutes anymore, but only a, a scale, a spectra, moral relativism, and anything can be entertained and, and there's no absolutes anymore. Well, that concept is contrary to the Bible. Our society was founded on the Bible, founded on right and wrong, and it, and it was put in for us to start questioning justice by these evil people who don't even, who aren't even alive anymore. And it is very hard, it's, it's hard for us as human beings to admit that we're wrong to begin with. And, but to admit that you've been tricked and hoodwinked and conditioned to believe stuff or to accept stuff that you wouldn't do it's kind of a difficult thing for us to get our heads around. It's difficult for us to acknowledge that. But when we stop back, take a helicopter view of society and realize that since the mid 90s until the mid 2020s, the place has gone downhill at a rapid, rapid pace. How did that happen and how do we turn it around? Well, What's the solution? The first is to understand history and learn the basics of what happened before. You know, that's just reality that you have to understand history to avoid repeating it. Because I tell you what, our enemies understand history and they choose to teach us something different. We have to understand that black is black and white is white and there are absolute truths. The way to stop communism and socialism is something that seems like a non sequitur to us today. A non sequitur is a logical fallacy, meaning that that one thing doesn't sound like it has anything else to do with the, with the other. But the first thing is you, you got to read your Bibles. You have to understand that that's the only source of truth that we can absolutely rely on. Understand that the highest authority in the universe is the creator of the universe, and there is a creator of the universe. And he has told us how he wants us to live through his word, the 66 book Bible that our leaders are supposed to swear their oaths to serve on. 
Our nation was founded by men who had deep respect for the Bible and created a nation where we would be free to worship as we see fit. Our founders had restraint with power. Today, our, our leaders are drunk with it. Our founders knew that their actions would be judged by a higher power because their culture was one founded on Scripture, albeit a flawed reality of the day. America, no nation is without sin, and America was not founded without sin. But it's a work in progress. They left us a mechanism to change and to get better. And uh, they created a government that could improve and change over time based on the will of the people through their elected representatives who swore an oath to God when they took power. Our way forward is to repent and turn back to God. And that path for our society today, not us as individuals, if you're listening to this, you probably already fear God, or at least you're curious. But our way back is to fear God, repent, turn around. And he's far away from our society. But we have to turn around one by one to study our Bibles and get back on the path. The path doesn't get shorter until each one of us decides to turn around and get on that path. This nation needs to go and become the prodigal son. We need to turn back to Yahweh, turn back to Yeshua, read our Bibles, understand that there are absolutes, that regardless of who is committing a crime, a crime is a crime, whether it's my guy or your guy, or somebody else's guy, or a galley. And that's the way we got to go. And we need to do it as individuals, because this may be the end. It may be that this is the last time that Babylon gets, the last chance that Babylon gets, and that we're about to go off the cliff. In that case, it becomes very important for us to repent and read our Bibles, and understand that as our friends and family do that, it's a long journey. We all didn't wake up knowing everything we know today. Reading the Bible, studying the Word, letting the Holy Spirit guide you back into truth, balancing out how to change your life and 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 move forward after accepting Yeshua as the Messiah, it's a, it's a long road, it's a long path. Along the way, you're going to believe different things. And we got to be patient with people as they go. But the basics, the basics, the Ten Commandments, that's pretty easy to do. And brothers and sisters, if we could evangelize that to get people to accept Yeshua as the Messiah and get back to the Ten Commandments, then we've done a good thing. So I want to thank you again for listening. And please drop by firstcenturychristianity.net to watch that incredibly interesting video that I keep teasing, but also to uh, give the website some, some, uh, you know, traffic, help us spread the word. And uh, if you feel motivated to donate to a ministry, we would be honored to handle Yahweh's, you know, donation on your behalf. Thank you so much. May Yahweh bless you and keep you in the name of his son, Yeshua. And I hope to see you all soon at our new facility in North Kansas City. Shalom. Bye.